Holiday season means stocking up on some essentials, like decorations and an ugly sweater. With the Bank of America Cash Rewards Credit Card, you can choose to earn 3% cash back on online shopping. The essentials have never felt more rewarding. Visit bankofamerica.com slash more rewarding to apply now. Copyright 2020, Bank of America Corporation. I'm Shonda Rhimes. If you've watched Grey's Anatomy or any of my TV shows, then you know I love to tell a good story. Well, now there's Shondaland Audio. We've partnered with iHeartRadio to launch a slate of great podcasts. You can listen to the first four right now. Katie's Crib, Criminalia, Go Ask Alley, and You Down. And we have so much more coming your way. We can't wait for you to hear it all. Welcome to Shondaland Audio. Listen to all the new Shondaland Audio shows on Apple Podcasts. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and Jerry's out there somewhere, and uh, this is Stuff You Should Know, Million Carat Plated Gold Edition. Gold plated. Isn't that what happens? Like, if you put a bunch of gold together, it, it means more carrots? I think so. I'm afraid to doubt you, though, because I had a movie crusher say that I'm, all I do lately is say you're wrong to you. <laughs> what do they mean lately? I know. I don't know. They was, must be a newcomer to the podcast. It's it was slightly precious. distressing. Says Josh has, <laughs> is all the time lately, Josh makes really good points, and all Chuck does is poo-poo it by just saying, no, you're wrong. <laughs> it's like, has that even happened once? If it makes you, I'm sure it's happened more than once, but if it makes you feel any better, I haven't noticed, and that's what really counts, don't you think? Yeah, I guess. Although there are... <laughs> like a million plus people listening. So I guess their opinions count as well. You're wrong. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, what's funny is I didn't even see that coming, Chuck. Oh, see there? Yeah, that was good Good stuff. And I almost just said the S word. That was good stuff. <laughs> You're wrong. It was mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's just do this for 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, no. Let's do a real podcast episode. This, uh, this was interesting. All I could think about was uh, heist movies. Oh, really? I don't know what I thought about. I think I was kind of stuck in the 30s. I just thought of everything as kind of old-timey and quaint. Sure. You know? All right. Because it's kind of in a way where the story really kicks off the story of Fort Knox, in case anybody's listening and didn't check the title. Oh, I thought we were doing an episode on the United States Bullion Depository. Buddy, that is the same exact thing in <laughs> okay. a lot of ways. But actually, they're different, too. Let's talk about this, right? So but for anybody who is outside the United States, and I would wager that a lot of you, I'd wager all the Golden Fort Knox, that a lot of you are very familiar with Fort Knox because it does seem to be kind of like this world-famous place where the United States hoards its gold and it's just totally Im- impenetrable. So don't even try. Um, but there's also like a lot of conspiracy theories too, that there's no gold in there. And we'll talk about all this and why there's gold in there too. But I feel like we should at least give like a, a background on Fort Knox and the ins and outs of it. Don't you? Yeah. Uh, in 1903, this is where it all started. Um, the U S army said, you know what? I think we need some training ground out here in Kentucky in West Point, Kentucky. And everybody said, why? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Good as place as any, I guess. Okay. And they use that area. They got a um they got a few counties to uh kindly hand them over some land and they use that area for training and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh made it a permanent training camp in 1918 and then named it after Henry Knox, a revolutionary war officer as mm-hmm. Camp Knox. And someone very quickly said, that doesn't sound at all tough. It sounds like Children belong here, and right. people are roasting s'mores. So right, they said, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> How about Fort Knox? And they it said, seems like all the best forts started out as camps. Yeah, so they said, sure. In 1932, it became officially Fort Knox. <laughs> right, nice one. Um, so, yeah, so it was started out as a legit army base, um, but then eventually in the 30s, which is why I've been stuck in the 30s, because so much of the story takes place there, um, the United States Mint said, hey— we could use a, a new spot to store some gold because we got a lot of gold. And this isn't even all of it, but we need a new spot to store some gold. And they actually took possession of part of Fort Knox um, and built what's known as, like you said, the United States Bullion Depository. 
um, there in Kentucky. And it is legitimately, Fort Knox is now not just the army camp, even more famously, it is really what you officially would call the United States Bullion Depository. Yeah, and the camp is still there, and some say it is um, there as sort of a, a means of maybe intimidation, maybe backup, like, hey, there's an army camp right next door. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, you know, also asked to borrow that name because it sounded tougher than the Bullion Depository. And they said, sure, you can go ahead and just call that building Fort Knox as well. Mm-hmm. And that's where we moved. Um, a, well, not all of it, but we had a lot of gold at the time, as you were saying. And it was um, it was a little unnerving, I think, to have most of the gold in the country stored in Philadelphia, at the mint there and in New York, because mm-hmm. it was so close to the coast. And if some warring nation wanted to invade us and grab our gold, then it, they wouldn't have far to go to get it onto a boat. Yeah, no, truly, which is, you know, pretty sensible, really. And I never really thought about that. But yeah, New York's not very far from water and neither is Philly. So why not? So they, they decided to move um, as much as they could. And there was silver moved, too. There was a lot of stockpiles of silver that we're not even going to bother with in this story because <laughs> it's silver. We're talking gold here. Yeah. And they, they moved a lot of it to Denver. And they very quickly said, well, the Denver Mint's a great place because it's protected from the from the Pacific Ocean by the Rocky Mountains, which would make it, that makes it much more difficult for an invading army to come in from the Pacific and steal it. But we're, we've run out of space, and we need some some more space for all the spillover gold. And that's when they decided to build in Fort Knox, which in Kentucky is protected f- from the Atlantic Ocean by the Appalachian Mountains. So it's pretty pretty clever why they why they chose Fort Knox. Yeah. So the Treasury, uh, like you said, took control. Of that land in 36 and then in 37, they, I mean, they started building, you know, their, you know, they couldn't just keep it in tents, even though those mm-hmm. intimidating Appalachian mountains were right there. They're like, we need a building here. So they built a building over um, just a few months, cost about That's a half impressive. a million. Yeah. Um, cost about a half a million bucks. And in 1937, they said, we're open for business. Um, bring that gold from New York City. They did, and they, they did it the way exactly the way that you would think they would do it. They had um, a lot of um, – they had a secret location where they were loading it. They sent a bunch of trains out um, that were decoys, um, and it didn't all happen at once. It wasn't one shipment uh, that made its way from New York and Philadelphia over to yeah. um, Kentucky. It would have been it in went, the movie, I think. Exactly. Yeah. But um, it happened like actually in in many shipments over several years. But supposedly they did it like sometimes darkness of night. Some, there were decoys um, and they were always protected by uh, a number of groups from the post office um, uh, inspectors that are licensed <laughs> to carry guns. Yeah. Which would, I hate to say it, everybody, but that's the one that you would try to hijack if you were going to hijack. Yeah. I mean, look, all the let's way to be honest. Like, yeah, right. Um, yes, Chuck. Uh, all the way to the army, you know, which I would I would probably not try to hijack that one. If I were going to hijack one, which I wouldn't do, uh-huh. it would probably be the postal inspector one. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they've someone has written a movie treatment at some point f- for a 1937 train on the way to Fort Knox heist type of thing. Right. And they surely would have cast. The, the, those poor post office gunslingers as the uh, the likely train. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> those poor guys. Um, so we've got the gold showing up at Fort Knox. And the thing is, is like this was like people knew about this. It wasn't done in secret. Like this was this is known about. Um, and I think I get the impression that the reason that it was talked about and discussed and there were like little tidbits here, or there in the in the um, in the popular media. Um to give this idea like, okay, yes, we're moving this gold, but like, th- don't even try it. Like, here's just enough that you need to know to not even come anywhere near this place. And over the years, little tidbits have kind of been released here there that give a pretty complete picture of what you would be dealing with if you did, in fact, try to uh, impregnate Fort Knox. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> pretty sexy. So, uh, first of all, you can't just take a tour. I mean, you can tour almost anything in this country except for Fort Knox. 
Uh, Even if you're a sitting congressperson, the chances are you're probably not going to get a tour. Yeah. I mean, if, if Ed is correct here, who helped us put this together, mm-hmm. there have only been three official tours. Is that right? Yeah, that's what I saw. So there's there was one from FDR himself, which is pretty understandable. Sure. Um, there was one in the 70s, which we'll talk about, um, which made sense, but it was a congressional delegation. And then I think in 2017, Stephen Mnuchin and a, a, a delegation toured it. So at, there's at least three, but those are the three that we know about. There may have been more, but the, I would think they would kind of publicize that because the whole point of being a delegate to tour Fort Knox is to basically reassure the public there's there's a lot of gold in there. Don't even worry about it. Yes, the gold's there. That's pretty much the reason why anybody gets a tour of Fort Knox. I wonder if they let FDR in and just to say, hey, you might as well just urinate on this golden person because that's what you're about to do <laughs> with policy. <laughs> that's, that's probably what happened. We'll get to that later with the gold standard. Okay. Uh, and, of course, you didn't urinate on it, even with policy. You don't know. You can't ever tell with that FDR. So here's a bunch of things. And this this next bit is going to be just sort of a lot of the facts and figures that we know and we've Mm -hmm. gleaned over the years. Some comes from official releases. Some comes from an old 1930s issue of Popular Mechanics, (laughs) which is kind of cool. But should we take a break first? Oh, sure, man. Yeah, I think that's a great cliffhanger. (laughs) All right, great. We'll be right back. Hey, Chuck, did you know that McDonald's, which you tend to think of as a pretty huge global restaurant, is actually a local one, too? That's right. Each McDonald's is owned and operated by people who live where that McDonald's is. When you eat at McDonald's, you're actually supporting American businesses, maybe even your own neighbor's business. Yeah, you're also supporting farmers and you're also supporting the Ronald McDonald House Charities. And Ronald McDonald House Charities give families with sick kids a home away from home when they have to travel far for the care that they need, which is a pretty great charity, if I do say so myself. Yeah, they've done great work over the years. And The franchisees also care about their community. They give back by helping first responders. They have a a program called Thank You Meal Program, which provides free food for essential health care workers and first responders. And when you own and operate a McDonald's, you make a promise to serve the community where you do business. And that's what those franchisees do every day. Which is why they say, Chuck, McDonald's serving here. You know, my friend, more than 75% of identity theft victims who had accounts opened in their name did not find out they had been victimized from their bank or their credit card company. Yeah. So don't be one of the 75% who didn't check more places identity theft could be hiding. Get LifeLock identity theft protection. That's right. LifeLock sees certain threats you could miss if you're only monitoring your credit and bank statements, and they'll alert you if they find something that could be suspicious. Yeah, plus, if you become a victim of identity theft, a U.S.-based identity restoration specialist dedicated to your case will work to fix it. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but LifeLock can help protect your personal information. That's right. So join now and save up to 25% off your first year just by going to LifeLock.com slash stuff. That is L-I-F-E-L-O-C-K dot com slash S-T-U-F-F for 25% off. All righty. So we promised you stats and figures about Fort Knox. And 1930s issues of Popular (laughs) Mechanics. I know. Uh, How's this for you? The vault requires, of course, multiple people to open it up, and mm-hmm. each person, nobody knows the entire combination. Each person re- it knows only a part of it, and even if you got it open, there's a 100-hour time delay lock. So you got to wait. <laughs> if you have them at gunpoint and you all force and you force them all to open it, you got to sit around and wait for four days, no matter what. That's my favorite one. It's pretty great. 
Mm -hmm. That and the fact that it's really just uh, artificial intelligence from the future is the only one that has the entire combination in its possession. <laughs> right. uh, what else? Um, well, let's see. There, the the vault itself is actually inside a building. So you remember in our Alcatraz episode where the cell blocks were buildings inside of the larger prison building? Yeah. That's e exactly the same thing. And not coincidentally, they were built around the same time. Um, so I think there was that kind of, you know, b impenetrable building within an impenetrable building in the zeitgeist kind of thing going on. Um, and the, the only way, the only place the vault and that building are connected is on the floor. But don't even think of coming up from under the floor because um, the flooring is two feet thick of granite, um, which you are not going to get through even if you successfully dug under. And I'll just go ahead and tell you why you would not be able to successfully dig under the building from the outside is because you have barrier after barrier after fence after razor wire separating you from the building. There's a huge blank field around the building, so yeah. it's not very easy to kind of walk up to it. And... <laughs> they apparently have said that the field around the building is a minefield. Yeah. <laughs> which means that they apparently studied cartoons to design right. <laughs> Fort Knox, <laughs> which I love. They're like, what would Wild E. Coyote do? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely worth Googling a, uh, like an aerial image of this building. It's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, it, it does. It sits out in the middle of nothing. Uh, in this big flat area, and they, there's like a circular dri uh, driveway around it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know it, it's made of what you think it's made of, which is granite and concrete mm -hmm. and steel. Uh, they said that the walls are uh, also two feet in thickness, and inside mm -hmm. those walls are fabricated steel coils that are so closely smushed together that they say a human hand can't even get between them. Right. Uh, so, so you need a baby. Thick. Or a child. Yeah, you need a baby hand. <laughs> so you got to bring a baby. You have to bring diapers and food to last the baby four days until the time lock opens. Oh, yeah, of course. Don't forget a gun to hold people off with. Yeah. And uh, probably some people you don't like to send through the minefield to clear a path for you. Yeah, and you got to get one of those diaper genies to put the diaper in. Otherwise, it's just yeah. going to smell in there. Oh, man, it would smell so bad in that <laughs> little building. Uh, here's another cool thing. Well, the whole the whole building isn't huge. I mean, it's... Right. It's not small. It's 10,000 square feet, but it's not, I, I don't know, you think of Fort Knox and you think of um, something the size of like a, a maximum security prison or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not huge, but um, the building inside the building, so the vault inside has an 18-inch space clear on every side, and they have all these mirrors everywhere. And, of yeah. course, now they have real cameras. I guess this was from the popular mechanics pre camera, you, you just use mirrors to make sure that right. you can see every square inch of this thing. Yeah. So if you did somehow manage to get inside the vault, the people who whose job it is, is to watch the vault would see you immediately. And po they Postal would just, service workers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They would just start, you know, lobbing dead letter office packages at you until you got annoyed and left. Uh, and of course, there's heavy artillery. There are um, four corner machine gun turrets essentially uh, mm -hmm. on the outer building just looking is down that on that so big... i'm sorry i was confused is that on the outer building or is that a part of the vault i think that's outside no okay I, I don't know i couldn't quite tell i didn't and i didn't see it outside did you see him outside well i mean i saw i mean i didn't see any really close-ups everything was kind mm -hmm. of an aerial mm -hmm. and i did see it look, what looked like corner turrets but maybe they are inside okay I don't know if I'd be shooting up machine guns inside a granite room. Yeah, that's actually probably a pretty bad idea. Dun, dun. I mean, I've seen Wiley e. Coyote, too. Those bullets bounce all <laughs> over right. the place. That's right. Um, so you've also got a door to contend with. So, so, so far, you've got two feet thick everything to get through, um, which means that your best bet is to go through the door. Because rather than 24 inches, it's only 21 inches thick. But... You should probably be dissuaded by the fact that it's blast, drill, and torch proof, said the uh, U.S. Mint director from back in 2016, Philip Deal. Yeah, and again, this is all under the banner of don't even think about it, buddy. <laughs> right. Um, between the uh, – there's a corridor that encircles the vault, and then the outer wall of the building, they do have some offices 
I guess that's where Dottie, the secretary, has been since 1950-something answering or, phones. Or Danny. Or Danny. <laughs> that's true. Sure. I don't think they gave jobs like that to Danny in the 1950s. Okay, maybe not in the 50s. That's fine. But I got called out for letting that Stooges comment pass, and I'm not going to – I'm not going on the grill again for you, pal. What, that ladies don't like the Three Stooges? Mm-hmm. We got not one, not two, <laughs> but thrice emails about that. <laughs> we, and most of them we were not happy. Well, uh, actually, two of the three were very fun about it and said that they love the Three Stooges. But Yes, but they weren't happy. Uh, one, I couldn't tell. And I even wrote her back, and I was like, I can't tell if you're really mad. Well, and I said, a good... <laughs> but I said, I was just, uh, if you Google women don't like three stooges, it's a, it's a trope. I mean, it's a familiar trope. I wasn't like inventing uh-uh. some sexist thing. I was just kind of funning around with it. Yeah. It's like everybody not liking Detroit or Kentucky. <laughs> like Google that. Right. Or Google women don't like Rush, the band. Hey, 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 let's just... <laughs> Let's bail out of this while we still have our limbs. No, people can like what they like, but trust me, I've been to a Rush concert, and there was there was a lot of masculinity in that room. What year was that? Because I'll bet I was at the same concert, depending. I went to, it must have been 88 or 89. Oh, no, I wasn't at that one. Okay. Yeah, you were. This would have been maybe like 92, 93. Mm, we just missed each other. Yeah, just by a few years. Had I just hung out at the Omni for three or four more years, or had you, we would have passed each other. Uh, But you're right. Women like all sorts of things, and men like all sorts of things. That's right. And Danny and Dottie can both be secretaries. That's right. And we don't even call them secretaries anymore. Chuck, we should just stop podcasting altogether. (laughs) We have aged out of it. (laughs) So to me, the only way in would be uh, the escape tunnel. Yes, which they thought of that. They they realized that they actually put a tunnel underground that you could use to get into the um, the depository, the actual vault, um, which they installed in case somebody got locked in there. Yeah. Which I'm really surprised they even installed that um, or, or designed that in there. I would think like if you have people guarding it as closely as it's being guarded all the time, that if you got locked in there, they could let you out. It just give you food or something through those those slots that for the um, four days, yeah. Or just I mean, have inconvenient. food in there. Yeah, that's an even better idea, actually. Now that now that you mention it, but no, they didn't do that. They actually put an escape tunnel in so that you can crawl out. It's not like a pleasant walk or anything. You crawl like through this tunnel and then out into the minefield, basically. But the door that you reach that lets you outside. Um, only opens from the inside. It's impossible to open from the outside, which I take to mean it doesn't have a doorknob on the outside. Right. <laughs> and then um, it's, it's guarded 24-7 by people who are ready to just shoot you up if you try to approach this door with your own doorknob that you brought to open it from the outside. Right, because you're not going to come in here uh, with a presumably a freight train to steal all this gold. Where, where are you going to put the tracks? You can't do it. <laughs> How are you going to get that gold out of there? I just love the fact that we're we're, we're trying to you know we're it. doing a podcast in 2020, <laughs> explaining and dissuading people from trying to get into Fort Knox. I mean, it's just so like 70s to me or 30s or it 50s. Is. You know, I love it. Uh, the other cool thing is is that it can go off grid, has its own water and power. So if you you know, in the movie version, of course, once again. I would think you would try and knock it off the line somehow, get those cameras down. But they say, no, 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 we have those generators. No, no. Yeah. Uh, we can live off grid. Uh, there's a gun range in the basement. So if you want to brush up on your machine gunning down there, you can do that. <laughs> no, that's kind of like a little little lawn yap to the whole thing. Like, by the way, these guys are training um, with guns downstairs in the basement for fun because they've got nothing else to do. They're just waiting for you to come. Now, who is guarding it, though? Um, from what I understand, they're treasury agents, right? Yeah. And the Army um, can be called in if needed because, again, it's like right there. Yeah, the U.S. Mint Police Force. Yeah. Which I imagine yeah. is a, it's probably a pretty cool gig to have. I don't know where they would have come up, but I swear we've mentioned that they exist before. It seems familiar to me. Have we done this all before? No, we haven't done this one, but we have talked about money and currency before. Yeah. Um. And I, I feel like that's where that's where we're at. Don't you like that that maybe we should talk about the gold itself? Because 
I mean, yes, it's cool that there's a 21-inch blast door and there's a door that only opens from the inside uh, in the escape tunnel. But I think what everybody's really fascinated with as much as anything is the fact that there is a, a lot of gold inside of Fort Knox. Yeah, and this will um, kind of hit home too if you've ever seen movies where you're bringing gold out of a place in a duffel bag. <laughs> Those gold bars weigh almost 28 pounds a piece. Just one. Yeah, just one of those things. So if you see people throwing them around in a movie or putting 10 of them, 15 of them in a duffel bag and slinging it over their shoulder, that is not realistic at all. They're seven inches long, three and five eighths inches wide, one and three quarters inches thick and weigh 27.5 pounds each. Yeah, or 400 troy ounces, if you know what that means. I have no idea. Um, and I think it's, what, about 10, 12 kilos a piece for those of you who aren't listening in the U.S. And the weird thing, I didn't realize this, but as far as the Treasury is concerned, and to me, this really kind of goes to demonstrate like how little the actual value of maintaining this gold hoard is, that just for bookkeeping, they they assign like a, a an arbitrary value, the statutory value of gold, it's what it's called, at $42.44 an ounce so that they can keep track uh, using that dollar amount of how much gold is in uh, Fort Knox rather than, you know, tracking it as it as it relates to like the international gold market. Yeah. And so I did the math this time. I did, too. Let's see if we can came up with the same <laughs> okay. figures. So the, supposedly there are 4,600 metric tons of gold. Uh, which, by the way, is about 2.5% of all the gold ever mined in the world in human history. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and if we're just going, I want to make sure we use the same numbers here, 4,600 metric tons yeah. and uh, use that 42.44 cents per ounce. Okay, I did it differently, but let's see if we came up with the same figure. Well, what 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 value did you use? Like, the... Oh, no, you go first, Mr. Gear Wrong Guy. <laughs> So using the statutory <laughs> value of gold that the U.S. has set, uh, I came up with $6.8 billion worth of gold. Close for mine. Close for mine. I used a different method. And this is one of the great joys of math is there are different <laughs> approaches to the same problem. What did, what did you do? Um, I took that 4,600 metric tons of gold mm -hmm. and um, divided it by pounds. 27.5 pounds. So I came up with the, the number of uh, individual bars. Then I multiplied that number of individual bars, which is 368,773 bars uh -huh. by that $16,888 per bar. Okay. And I came up with in the neighborhood of $6.256 billion worth of gold. Well, first of all, there's a, a psychologist that's listening to this that is Really, <laughs> yeah. Looking at what that means for both of our personalities, for sure. Uh, it's got to say a lot, you know. Did you use? Are you sure you use metric tons and not just tons? Yeah, I I, I did um, a pound to metric ton conversion. You know how you can go on the internet and just say <laughs> pound metric ton, and like it brings up a little conversion thing for you. Yeah, That's I was just I, I was just making sure because I, at first I didn't do metric ton, and that was different. You and did a short ton. That is short ton, and that came to about six, closer to your number. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I and I actually rounded a little bit because I, I was like, E, what the heck is that when the, the, the total came up? Uh -huh. So I went back and redid it, and yeah. I didn't feel like <laughs> plugging same, in all the same numbers, so I rounded it a little bit. What I, I did, wonder... What I did was I just took uh, uh, how many ounces are in, 46, in, a, ton, in a metric ton, mm -hmm. multiplied that by 4,600, and then multiplied that by 4,244. Right. Well, I propose that we move along because I just suddenly realized there's probably people whose like their fingertips have dug under their eyeballs. They're so they're in such agony hearing us discuss math like this. Well, what's what's important is that uh, the Fed in New York actually has more gold in their Manhattan vault, which was in a movie, uh, 6,000 mm -hmm. tons of gold. That would have been Die Harder? Uh, Die Hard 3, I believe. It may have been. Die Another Day? I don't know. But it was a good one. That was the one with Sam Jackson. Yeah, that was pretty good. Um, and by the way, I need to say something. I realized that I, I said Event Horizon is a good movie and holds up. <laughs> I went back and saw it again oh, and no. again. Uh -huh. And I was like, this is way jokier than I remember from last time. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, and sadly, there's a, there's a sheen or a coating of hokiness 
that I guess maybe they brought in somebody to punch up the script or something, and that was their contribution, but it's not. So it doesn't hold up anymore? No. And it's a great galactic Lovecraftian horror movie Mm -hmm. in concept and in some parts, but no, it's unfortunately rather hokey. Uh, I'm I'm a little gutted to say that, as our British friends would say. Maybe you should watch it again in like three years, and it might be back on track for you. (laughs) I will. Maybe maybe it's me that's the problem. (laughs) Well, you know, taste waxes and wanes. Yeah, that's true. That's true, Chuck. Uh, There's another, there's some other stuff in Fort Knox, and there has been other stuff through history Mm -hmm. in Fort Knox because it's just a great place to keep stuff if you don't want to lose it or have it stolen. Uh, They have some rare coins in there. Uh, These are coins that were not released to the public. Uh, They may have been promotional coins or test pressings. Um, And so there's some of that stuff, including... Uh, the Sacagaway dollar coins that flew on the space <laughs> shuttle. Is that funny? Yeah, that's Sacagawea. Yeah, that's like the American bastardization. It's Sacagaway. Oh, well, maybe we should keep this in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I've never heard anybody say that. I really thought you just mispronounced it. Other people say it like that? Yeah, I think it's one of those things where like the, the native pronunciation is Sacagaway and Americans were like, Sacagawea. No. Oh, my God. My I've got so much egg on my face. Maybe we won't keep this part in. You have to say it. You said it wrong, though. You have to be like, that's wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So it is Sacagaway, huh? Is it Sacagawea? I think it's just Sacagaway, and I only learned that from uh, Ken Burns. God bless Ken Burns. America's teacher. Haircut, <laughs> and you, man. Thank you for setting me straight in front of a million people. Uh, let me see here. A 1933 gold double eagle $20 coin. That's kind of cool. Yeah, sure. There's an aluminum dime. No, penny. An aluminum penny from 1974, which... I'd love to see is, that thing. I would too, but it just strikes me as a little sad. Sure. Um, the the there there've also been because Fort Knox is just so well known as this impregnable place, and it really is. You know, legitimately, you you cannot get into it no matter how hard you try. Um, it's actually served as the site, the storehouse for some like truly valuable stuff, um, like the the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, um, the Gettysburg Address, a Gutenberg Bible. Um, uh, the Magna Carta actually during World War II, England's like, hey, can you hang on to this for us? Because the Germans are really like up our butts right now. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So they, so we held that at Fort Knox during World War II, um, which is, I mean, that's just fascinating to the idea that some, apparently some secret service agent traveled secretly with a bunch of these documents from Washington, D.C., uh, and put him on a train out to Kentucky to go to to be held in Fort Knox during World War II. I love it. That's really cool. And that was yeah. uh, temporary, I think. Didn't they return them right afterward? Oh, yeah, for sure. Apparently, they dedicated the Jefferson Memorial in 1943, and they're like, we need to get the, the, um, the Declaration of Independence out there. And they found out that the guards were using it as a placemat. To eat their dehydrated <laughs> right? foods. No, they they'd swapped it with with uh, something that they only use crayon to forge. <laughs> Kept the original themselves. So should we break now before conspiracies, or wait and break before gold standard? We'll break now, and I'm not 100 percent sure I'm going to be able to come back from that Chicago way thing. Okay. So it might just be you, and we come back from from break. No, never. But I- Stuff You Should Know is sponsored by Alexa, and today is all about Fort Knox. Yeah, while Fort Knox is a repository for all kinds of fantastic and priceless things, Alexa is a repository for almost everything, from news to entertainment to books to podcasts. Just our podcast, right? No, Alexa believes in equal opportunity podcasting. You know, while quarantining, I've listened to so many podcasts, and they're good for, like, working out, cooking, doing yard work, hanging around in bed. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Alexa, how many podcasts are in the world? Currently, there are over 800,000 active podcasts and over 54 million podcast episodes. Wow. We have tons of competition. Yeah, and there are podcasts on almost every single topic. Well, I know Alexa also reads books, which is awesome because sometimes I just want to relax and let someone else tell me a story. 
Yeah, Alexa can read books, and not just the books you purchase through Amazon, but thousands of audiobooks, too. Alexa, do you like to read? I love to read. Every book feels like a new adventure. Listen, it sounds like Alexa brings all the fun, but my question is, does she bring the beat? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you asking if Alexa plays music? Well, let's just move the furniture back because we're about to have a dance-off, Chuckers. Alexa, play 90s hip-hop on iHeartRadio. Getting 90s hip-hop station from iHeartRadio. Hey, friends. When you're at home, you might be all about relaxing and spending time with your family. And I got to say that Alexa can make that much easier for you to do that. Yeah, because let's say you want to unwind and listen to a podcast. She's always there with a good recommendation because, you know, you can't just listen to stuff you should know all the time, even though it is the best, admittedly. That's right. Or if you need a funny dad joke that you want to steal and tell your kid later, Mm -hmm. you might want to listen to stuff you should know as well. Yeah, or some days you don't feel like reading the news, Alexa will read it for you. All you have to say is, Alexa, what are today's headlines? And off she goes. That's right. You may not even realize what you did before Alexa came along. Oh, I can tell you. People manage their own calendars and shopping lists. We don't want to have to do that again. It's not like we're lazy. It's just that Alexa is a lot more organized than we are. That's right. Life with Alexa is the best because she provides balance and accountability, meaning she reminds you to do stuff that you might otherwise push off another day or even another week, like calling your parents or working out. All you have to do is say, Alexa, Remind me to work out tomorrow at 7 a.m., and she does. With Alexa, a voice is all you need. Okay, Chuck, so one of the things, one of the favorite things Americans love to do is to suggest, quite seriously in a lot of cases, that there is no such thing as a gold in Fort Knox and that there hasn't been gold in there for a very long time. And if you went there and you saw gold, well, you're a fool because the best thing, the best possible scenario is that you saw something like tungsten that was spray painted or plated in gold and that the gold in Fort Knox is not there and hasn't been there for a very long time. And not only that, it was sold for the most nefarious, outrageous purposes we can possibly come up with. Yeah. So they audit uh, Fort Knox and they count the gold. Allegedly. Supposedly. Dottie and Danny get in there with their (laughs) adding machine and they type everything out. Um, And I love how Ed put this. He said that all the conspiracy theories rely on, quote, some fundamental misunderstanding of how currency works, how the gold standard worked or just outright nonsense. (laughs) But it's kind of true. Yeah, no, it totally is. Because there's this call for, which we'll talk about, the the gold to be used again the way it originally was, which is to back our currency. If, if, that's the, if that's really the basis of your problem with the idea that the gold was secretly sold off in Fort Knox, then, then yeah, you, you misunderstand how currency works or how economies work, and you probably don't fully understand how the gold standard was not really great and that America actually blew up and the whole world blew up after we switched off of the gold standard. That's how the the global economy really started to take off was when we decoupled our currency from being pinned to gold. So that's another seems to be another um, factor in, in, in kind of banding about conspiracy theories about Fort Knox gold, too. Yeah. And a lot of these conspiracy theories are anti-Semitic. Yeah. Um, there are, believe it or not, there are some really smart people who think who who may or may not believe in some of these theories and some that believe we should go back to the gold standard, uh, mm-hmm. including Alan Greenspan, um, a woman named Judy Shelton, who uh, Trump tried to push for appointment to the Fed, uh, to mm-hmm. the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure if she believes in the conspiracy theories or she just wants to go back to the gold standard. Yeah, they're not. I mean, it's not hand in hand. It's right. just if you do think we should go back to the gold standard, it's basically impossible for your attention not to fall on Fort Knox. And then you may be like, well, is there even gold there? Yeah, true. But there are some truly wackadoo things out there. Uh, this uh, Peter Better guy. Uh, oh, is that how you're saying his name? What, what is it? Better Better? If, <laughs> if his, yeah, if his name's not Peter Beater. <laughs> Then I'm sad. <laughs> I am too. Peter, yeah. Peter. 
B E T E R. That's what I'm going to call him at least. Yeah, it's like Peter with a B. Yeah. But his first name's Peter. It's <laughs> magnificent. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah. So he uh, has thrown a lot of conspiracies out there since the 70s, uh, including a popular one that we sold off uh, all the gold to these global elites for next to nothing. Mm-hmm. So they could hoard that gold. And then one day uh, just destabilize the economy of the world and, uh, and you know, ascend to power, basically. Yeah, because they would have all the money and they sunk the value of the money so they could buy everything else at rock bottom prices like they bought the gold. Apparently, this involves the Rothschilds, which automatically makes the whole thing anti-Semitic because the Rothschilds started out and, you know, are still around as far as I know um, as a Jewish banking family. Uh, many, many centuries ago um, and rose to power and wealth pretty quickly and actually had a huge um, role in a lot of world affairs, like were able to bail out entire nations like France after they went into debt over war, like this family could do that. And it started a lot of conspiracy theories. So um, they're kind of like one of the OG conspiracy theories. And usually it was uh, based on a combination or uh, it was based on suspiciousness of a combination of them being Jewish and them being extraordinarily wealthy. Yeah, there's this other guy is uh, his name is Jan Nivenhuis. I don't, I'm sure that's wrong. Um, he had an alias named Kuz Jansen, K-O-O-S. And I listened to and read some interviews with this guy. Mm-hmm. And he did you check into him? He seems he seems like a pretty level-headed economist that, right. that just seems to think that these audits aren't correct and there is something hinky going on. He didn't seem really out there, though. No, but it, I, it seems like a case of paying too much attention to details and, and starting to see things that aren't necessarily there. Or if you do turn up a discrepancy, assuming that it does reveal some larger plot rather than just being a a mistake or an accounting error or somebody forgot to carry the one. Mm -hmm. That's my impression. I I could be wrong. I don't know much about Coos Jansen. Yeah, but uh, the interview just seemed very level headed. Um, He wasn't talking about um, robotoids, which is what Peter Beter talks about. Right. uh, Literally. Talks about stuff like that. Well, that's what makes it believable is the oids on the end. If it were just robots, it would just seem rather far-fetched. What about Ron Paul? His is a little out there. He thinks it's all fake, right? So Ron Paul, I can't tell if Ron Paul is the source of a lot of this or was an amplifier for a lot of it. But uh-huh. he he's tapped into or is part of one of the larger um, kind of followings of of conspiracy theories as far as Fort Knox is concerned, which is that that either, like I was saying earlier, there's either no gold there, really, or the gold that is there is fake, and the real gold has been sold, and that the U.S. has been doing this for a very long time for all sorts of uh, uncertain reasons, um, like that, and that usually these days that China's been the big recipient of cheap gold, and maybe we've mm-hmm. been doing that because if we sell China a bunch of cheap gold, it will um, actually keep the dollar low and will strengthen our exports. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, there also seems to be a certain amount of like national pride associated with it. We're like, no, that's our goal. That's the people's goal. It mm-hmm. can't be sold off secretly by the government. And here's to me where it's like, even if there isn't any gold in Fort Knox, at some point in, in the not too distant past, but the past for sure, we've gone so far beyond that having any importance whatsoever yeah. based on the dollar value of the gold in Fort Knox that it it legitimately doesn't matter. But that's why I think some people are like, no, it does matter. That is our gold. That's America's gold. Um, I've seen it referred to. I think Ed said somebody referred to it as the equity of our national wealth. Um, and there seems to be like a certain amount of like American pride or patriotism in in being really mad about the idea that Fort Knox doesn't have any gold anymore, that the American people were duped by, you know, whatever elites are running the show at the behest of whatever Jewish people are running the elites. Right. Because uh, here's the deal. And this is where we kind of get in more to the of the gold standard. And we talked about this in currency and how both of us are kind of consistently blown away that money all money is is just something that everyone has agreed on has value yeah and that's which we've that's been doing forever yeah since there has been little 
ingots and trinkets. Yes. As long as you agree, I mean, it could be a, a well, it could be a stick. It has to be something that <laughs> you can't just go out and forage, although you can with gold, which is a problem. Well, yeah, you can. I mean, like, think about wampum. That was um, extensively used in, I believe, the Pacific Northwest by more than one um, tribe and nation. Um, wampum was, they were like little little seashells that you could go and collect if you wanted to, and they were considered valuable currency and were for a very long time, too. So it could conceivably be a stick as far as humanity is concerned. Right. But in our case, in, in the case of paper money these days, it, it is, uh, we've had to make, make it incredibly hard to recreate and counterfeit. Uh, you can also listen to our counterfeiting episode. But what really struck me kind of with that thought experiment this time is that gold really doesn't have much value either as a commodity. It's right. it's nice for making pretty trinkets, but uh, and it, they use it in some electronics and stuff like that. But we've also just sort of agreed that gold is valuable. And the only thing that really has true value is food, air, and water. If you and think love. if you think about it, and love. Mm-hmm. And the irony is is that we're doing our best to to kill all that stuff away. You know, oh, Chuck, the stuff that really matters, man. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. I want to give you a hand to help you down from your soapbox. And I'm going to put a king robe around you. OK, OK. Is it With gold like flecked? The, the, it's gold flecked and it's got like the little white leopard um, like, oh, yeah. like collar. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Whatever that is. You look great in it. That was wonderful. <laughs> no, it's just it's just so funny. These things that we've agreed have value really don't. And the things that really, truly have value are really just the things that keep people alive. Right, right. But even like taking that hippie stuff out of the equation, uh-huh. there was a time <laughs> where people said, um, no, gold gold actually is valuable. People have valued gold for eons now. Like it's one of the first things humans agreed had inherent value, even right. though it doesn't really have inherent value. Because it was shiny. Um, yeah. And so it made sense that we we would say, OK, gold's really hard to lug around and like um, it, it's it, you just you don't want to actually trade gold. How about we make paper that represents a certain amount of gold? And um, so that's kind of where we got paper currency in the world. And, and that's what we've been using for a very long time. But over time, the the problems, the issues that can arise from pinning your, your currency to gold um, they became apparent. For one, you're very you're limited to the amount of gold that exists in the world, which is substantial. I mean, all the gold in Fort Knox is only two and a half percent of the all the gold that was ever mined. So there's a lot of gold in the world, but that's a finite amount, which is why some people are like, yeah, that's why we should pin our currency to gold. It it, it prevents it from getting out of hand, and you can't just print however much you want. Um, the problem is, is it's like you were saying, like with a stick, you can go in the forest and go get a bunch of sticks. Conceivably, you, a private company, could go mine a bunch of gold that you found. You found a, a hoard, and um, y- you you can mine it, and that will affect the the va- the value of not just gold, but of entire national economies and the global economy as a whole if everybody's pinning their currency to gold. Yeah, and the thing is, it it also, like if your economy is backed only by gold, it's really tough to make adjustments to the economy as a government, which is something as things have become more complicated over the years with finance throughout the world, we've relied upon. Um, And I don't even think we even mentioned that the, the reason we did this to begin with is because when we first had the idea of paper currency, mm-hmm. uh, people were like, nah, I don't trust that at all. Right. Like right. coins that people were kind of used to because they'd been using trinkets and ingots and coins for many, many years. But mm-hmm. when they brought out paper dollars, and part of this was because, uh, understandable, because private banks, and I think we talked about this in currency, um, and especially in the South, pre-Civil yeah. War South, there were all kinds of values uh, for their paper currency. So none of it really meant anything. Yeah, a bank, uh, a company, uh, a town could print their own money. There was no federal monopoly on printing money in the United States until uh, sometime after the Civil War, I think. So people just said, yeah, we don't like this paper currency thing. So we came Mm -hmm. along and said, all right, well, what if we back it by gold? And in theory, all the money has a real gold value attached to it. And you can even come trade it in for gold if you want to. Right. So that's that's how we went forward for a very long time. And then kind of slowly but surely, we started to move away from it, particularly starting um, in 1913, uh, where the Federal Reserve was established. Um, 
which a lot of people, especially ones who think we should go to the gold standard and people who think that we shouldn't have um, or that there's no gold in Fort Knox, believe kind of ruined the the world when we established the Federal Reserve. Um, And one of the first steps it said was like, okay, we need to maintain 40 percent of the value of all of our currency in circulation in gold as a, as a country, which was a lot different from 100%. <laughs> yeah, that's a time. huge amount of money that can, can now be printed. And more money that's out there, more things can be bought because that money can be traded for services and goods and you can employ people with it. And all of a sudden, your economy can start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's exactly what happened. And as that became more and more evident, um, we started moving further and further away from from um, the gold standard. Yeah, and like I said earlier, kind of joke that Roosevelt, uh, they allowed him to urinate in person on the gold. <laughs> right. uh, he really led the charge in the 30s um, because of World War I and the, and the Great Depression and said, you know what, we really kind of need to get away from this gold standard officially, and mm-hmm. I'm going to take a series of actions weakening that link uh, between gold uh, dollars being backed by gold, and you can't exchange it anymore, everyone. So don't even think about that. And not only that, you can't hoard gold. Like we, we basically want all the gold, and we all the and gold. we want to hang on to it. Yeah, and so for a very long time, the only reason people maintain gold, uh, or countries maintain gold, or the United States maintain gold, was to um, to pay off foreign debts if need be. Uh, and then Nixon said nuts to that in 1971. And from that moment on, the United States currency and economy was decoupled from gold and has been ever since. Um, and you again, you can uh, look, I'm not a, a, a Rothschild robot oid. I just believe in progress, basically. And if you go back and look at the world economy and the United States economy since 1971, it's made some pretty impressive gains since then. Um, and that's largely due to decoupling from gold and being able to print money. Now, that said, and this is an entirely different podcast that I think we need to do sometime, there are massive problems with paper money, sure. paper currency, what's called fiat currency um, or a fiat system of currency, where by fiat, by proclamation, we say our currency is worth this amount. And that's what we do now, which is totally made up and totally in the air. But as long as people have faith in, in the government and the economy and the, the workforce, um, we can survive those ups and downs through that, that, that sense of faith, not just in, of, among our citizens, but also people around the world. Understand? Yeah. I mean, let, let's just all keep agreeing. Let's keep that pinky swear going. <laughs> exactly. Paper, so why do we still have has value? <laughs> why do we still have Fort Knox then if we don't need the gold? Well, I mean, they're not just going to give it away. You still got to keep it in one in a couple of places, right? That's I mean, that's one thing. I think there is a certain amount of that national pride too even among the government. Yeah. Like, we got we got a bunch of gold and it's in Fort Knox and it's almost like symbolic of America's wealth and strength. Um one thing I did see is there are like lots of other countries have lots of other gold hoards themselves and although the gold market is basically separate, it's like its own thing that's, you know, it, it responds and reacts to the the um, the stock exchanges um, and other markets, but it's not it's not you know entangled with it's its own thing. So really, if you um, released a bunch of gold, you're really going to mess with the gold market. But it's going to have a ripple effect through the through the world, um, the, in the other um, markets in the global economy. So it would be really foolish to release a bunch of gold onto the market for the U.S. to sell or any country to sell its gold hoards off. It would be a real big problem that you don't need to have. It's easier to just keep the gold in Fort Knox instead. Agreed. That's why it's still around. You're not wrong. This turned out to be uh, pretty good, aside from Sacagawea. (laughs) And now I'm wondering if I even pronounce wampum correctly. Well. How humiliating, Chuck. Wampum was a real thing, you know. Uh, If you want to know more about Fort Knox and start looking at pictures of it, you'll, you'll see what we're talking about. And since I said you'll see what we're talking about, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this Wetlands follow-up uh, from Donna. Hey, guys. Been listening for many years and always enjoy the shows and the banter. Uh, today, out on my morning walk, I was listening to Wetlands, 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 and serendipitously came upon cattails just as you brought them up. 
Wow. We love this stuff, these little coincidences. Yeah, she's like, now I'm listening to the Fort Knox episode, so <laughs> lay it on me. I'm, tun- I'm tunneling in as we speak. <laughs> uh, it was one of those weird coincidence moments that I just had to record. I walked off the path into the grasses and took a quick cattail selfie, which I included in this email. Lovely picture. Uh, growing up in New Jersey in the 80s, cattails were called punks. And my dad would take the dried out plants and light them uh, to keep away mosquitoes. That's uh, what a punk is. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Have you heard of that? Uh-huh. Never heard of that. Yeah. Back then, it seemed like a normal thing to do, but having grown up and moved away from New Jersey, boo. I have never come across anyone that ever uh, partakes in this practice anymore. It was such a huge part of my childhood summers. I'd forgotten about it until now, until listening to the episode. And then I happened... Uh, to walk upon some in the adjacent mar- marshes in that moment truly delighted me. Uh, mosquito season is over where I live now in D.C., but on next summer's to-do list is to cut some cattails from the parkland and introduce my two teen sons to that distinctive punk smell. That uh, may be against federal law now, though. Oh, really? <laughs> Taking punks from the, the, the parkland, it seems like a, a against the law. Well, I'll tell you what, Donna H., look into that. We don't want you to get in trouble. That's right. Uh, or to do anything you shouldn't do. But uh, I, I get the urge to want to introduce things to your children that you did back then that weren't necessarily proper. <laughs> yes. But the nanny state will say no and throw you in jail. So don't try it, Donna. Yeah, maybe. I mean, where I saw the wetlands recently, where I was hiking here in Arabia Mountain, you can't, beautiful granite outcroppings, part of Stone Mountain, actually. And mm-hmm. you can't, uh, my daughter wanted to take those rocks. I was like, you can't take the rocks, sweetie. You go get thrown in jail by the nanny state. Can't do it. Got to leave those rocks. Um, What else did Donna say? Anything else? No, that's it. That's from Donna H. That was great, Donna. Thank you very much. Be careful with the cattails. We won't tell if you do, but we just don't want you to get in trouble. Um, We're no snitches. Uh, If you want to get in touch with us like Donna did, uh, we want to hear from you. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. I'm Shonda Rhimes. If you've watched Grey's Anatomy or any of my TV shows, then you know I love to tell a good story. Well, now there's Shondaland Audio. We've partnered with iHeartRadio to launch a slate of great podcasts. You can listen to the first four right now. Katie's Crib, Criminalia, Go Ask Alley, and You Down. And we have so much more coming your way. We can't wait for you to hear it all. Welcome to Shondaland Audio. Listen to all the new Shondaland Audio shows on Apple Podcasts.